Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. I got nothing. I hate when I have nothing to talk about. No history, no interesting stories to explain how or why something happened, but I can't find anything. I don't doubt that somewhere in some old issue of Wizard Magazine there is an interview that explains how the hell Batman fights Xenomorphs happened, but wherever it is, I couldn't find it. But you know what? As it turns out, I don't think I've ever talked about the Aliens franchise before on this show. So, I guess, quick rundown of my thoughts on all the movies up to this point. Classic and atmospheric. Watch it every year around Halloween. Also classic. Basically define the entire franchise from here on out. Wants to be so much more than it is. Lacks memorable characters. But strangely, the scene with the xenomorph sniffing at Ripley has become iconic despite the movie's other flaws. I've never seen the assembly cut. I hear it's supposed to be better. Underrated. It's got flaws, especially since the middle feels more like a series of vignettes and not a character arc, but it's got its own look, flavor, and memorable characters. Okay for the most part, but feels like a lot got cut. True story, saw this and Yu-Gi-Oh! the movie back to back when I worked in a movie theater as a teenager. Never saw it, but everything I've heard and seen about it suggests I'd hate it. Yes, I'm counting it. There's a lot to like, but so many, so many stupid characters and decisions. Also... What was that black goo? Slightly less stupid characters, more stupid script. Especially tying in the origin of the Xenomorphs to humanity, that is dumb and fanficy. With that out of the way, let's dig into Batman slash Aliens number one and see how the Dark Knight contends with a perfect life form. The cover's pretty damn good. A painted image of Batman and a xenomorph with half of their faces mirroring each other. It's a standard kind of image. Hero and villain reflected in each other, that sort of thing. But I especially want to give credit for the shadow on the xenomorph's head farther up that helps mirror Batman's horn. Just nicely done. Interestingly, the cover artist, Bernie Wrightson, also does the interior artwork, but it was colored by Matthew Hollingsworth, so it's not the same painted look. I always prefer the cover artist and the interior pencils be by the same artist, so that someone picking it up knows what to expect, but having a different style feels like a nice compromise. We open with Batman falling down in front of an ugly greenish-brown gradient. The nights of my life are spent grappling with leering psychotics, criminals whose inner psyches are as scarred and twisted as their outward appearances. But enough about YouTubers. In them, I believed I had seen the heart of horror. It turns out they were merely the pancreas of horror. I've learned I had no concept of horror. Friday the 13th movies just confused me. Where are these kids' parents? The events replay themselves in my mind with an intense clarity I've encountered only once before. The memories of my parents' murder. So not the death of Jason Todd, not the events of the killing joke, not any of the big crossover events. No, no, no. The events that were just as traumatic as losing his parents were running into some really powerful aliens. He's parachuting into a jungle along the Mexican-Guatemalan border. Ironically, he's looking for the team that fought the first Predator. I drop lazily toward the teeming green hell below. Lazily? Is that why you're bending your back in a weird way and bringing your leg up like you were doing a ballerina pose? 
He lands in a small river, but is instantly confronted by a woman with a gun. Both are naturally confused by the other, but she does try to save him from a crocodile sneaking up behind him. She misses the shot, forcing Batman to wrestle with it a bit, and he forces it back. Yeah, yeah, impressive Batman, but Mr. T once swung an alligator over his head and threw it away. Kind of hard to beat that. After getting rid of the croc, Batman is confronted by another guy, who wants Bats to get out of the way so he can shoot it so they don't have to worry about it coming back for them later. The croc was only following its nature. It never kills, just for pleasure. Crocodiles are blameless and without sin. When the guy refuses to put his gun down, Batman of course snatches it out of his hand. Unfortunately, the sequential art kind of failed here, since it actually shows Batman taking the gun away with one hand in the middle panel, and then the next making the guy look completely flummoxed. The implication is supposed to be that Batman is doing it so fast the guy barely registered it, but with the panel in between without even some motion blur or something, it just makes it look like the guy spaced out for a second, and Batman took his time taking it out of his hands. Also, that gun is ridiculous. I mean, it was still the 90s, but by 1997, the comic industry had gotten most of the 90s out of their system. More people show up, and Batman gives the gun back, demanding they all leave since they'll get in the way of his job. Captain Trigger Happy just laughs him off. I think maybe you must be confused. Only mission round here is the one we're on. Government sort of thing. I'm the government. I'm the government. I'm the reason nothing works. He says Batman is the one leaving, and oh dear lord! Well, I see why he has the giant gun now. The guy is clearly suffering from Youngblood's disease with those blank eyes. I mean, at least Batman has the excuse of something in the mask obscuring his eyes. What's the deal with this guy's sudden blindness? I am on a mission of mercy. I have one partner, and I left him at home. He wanted a special kind of South American rat for dinner, and I'm not gonna disappoint him! The woman from earlier, Hyatt, tells the guy, Seely, to cool his jets since their operations already gotten screwed over. Their equipment ended up at the bottom of a swamp, and they'll need whatever help they can get. Unless this guy's dressed up for Halloween, I'd say it's a safe bet he can take care of himself. Actually, I'm dressed up for Easter. I'm part of a weird denomination. Hyatt explains that normally their protocol is to kill civilians who learn about their missions like this, but given the circumstances, they need all the help they can get especially since both of them are headed in the same direction. My name's Hyatt. You're... Just who you think I am. Well, thank God you're here, Green Lantern! She introduces their special forces team as the Dead Man's Hand. Well, those first three words are gonna be accurate, at least. She introduces each one, but the only one that I feel deserves special mention is Gantry, who looks exactly like a skinny Guy Gardner. I keep having to double take because I mistake him for Guy. After explaining again how all their gear went down into the swamp by accident, she asks about his. What about you? Your gear come down somewhere around here? I'm carrying everything I need. Let's see, uh, condoms, Pez dispenser, Game Boy Pocket... Oh, wait, I forgot to change out the batteries before I left. Damn. They march for several hours, Hyatt trying to make small talk with Batman, but he doesn't really care. Despite the sun going down, it's still 95 degrees, and everyone in the unit is tired and hot. Seely decides to have a dick measuring contest. You. You don't look like you're sweating. You go walk point for a while. What about this outfit makes you think I'm not swimming right now? Is that an order? Damn right it is. I don't take orders. And that's why Batman got fired from his job at Wendy's. Seely decides to attack him since he doesn't like Batman's attitude, but of course it's Batman, so he just punches him in the collarbone? This is kind of an awkward panel. Anyway, he punches him through the brush and into a clearing. Lighting up a flare, they realize they've arrived where they meant to. An alien spacecraft crashed right outside of a ruined temple. Dibs! I call dibs! Bat dibs are mine! Everyone seems to be in awe of this sight. Except for Batman. This isn't what I'm looking for. The spaceship I'm looking for is orange. They decide to go inside and investigate the ship, Hyatt continuing to try to make conversation with Batman without success. He's too busy investigating a hole no doubt made by acid blood. But the entire group soon comes running to the screams of one of the men, who's found an alien attached to the wall in front of a xenomorph egg. 
and a hole in his chest. The guy admits he was startled and shot the alien in the head, but it was already dead from the chest wound. The group banters and speculates while Batman does the investigation, and to make up for the poor sequential art from before, we have a series of three panels right after a shot of him looking. One of the egg, one of a dead face hugger, and one of the chest hole, almost as if he was putting together the pieces of what happened. But we're here to snark, so dialogue. What could do that, Seely? That hole? You don't... You don't think it was alive when it happened, do you? Who am I, Dr. Spock? How should I know? Do I look like I've been played by three different actors? You mean Mr. Spock. He was the guy on Star Trek. Dr. Spock was the baby guy. Yeah, I was referencing the baby guy, dumbass! That's an egg! Seely asks Batman if he has an opinion about any of this. Elves. Batman says he's not certain, only that they should search the ship for more evidence and be extremely careful. Later, they build a fire as one guy on the team leaves to chase after a howler monkey he wants to kill because he finds it annoying. And they just let him do so because these are not very bright people. They exposit that they found five alien bodies, two of which had chest burster holes in them. But enough about that, Hyatt asks Batman why he doesn't carry a gun. I have my reasons. And we see an image of his mother in the smoke with a gun being used to snap off her pearls. The main reason is because they're ineffective against these smoky ghosts of my parents that continue to haunt me. What about you? Why do you carry a gun? Because she's in the military? She thinks the question is more why she's involved in any of this. Ambition. I'm the first and only woman on any HS Covert Ops team. I do it because it's the sort of thing that gets you noticed, moves you up the ladder. I'm gonna be a woman with power someday. I've wanted that ever since I was a little girl. I'll do whatever it takes to get me there. No, I, I was literally asking why you used a gun. I, I just think little boomerang projectiles are cooler. Seely once again asks why Batman's here if not for the ship, and he once again cryptically says it's a mission of mercy, and that he needs to get back to his search. But before he can leave, they're interrupted by the sound of the guy who walked away, his gun going off, and him screaming. They chase after the noise and find his gun, along with some spilled blood. Batman investigates and indicates that he was carried away by something. And the tracks are like nothing he's ever seen before. Big elves! The trail leads inside the ruined temple. Batman wants them to remain behind, but Seely insists on following to take care of their own. You saw the conditions of those aliens on the ship. You have no way of knowing what's in there. I'm better equipped to deal with the unknown. Got all the equipment I need right here. You fool! A gun can't stop one face! After a minor scare with some bats coming out of the place, they enter. Heading deeper into it while tracking a scent, they come across another person, also dead like the aliens, with an egg in front of it. Batman explains that this guy is why he's here. His name was Abel Barrett. He's a geologist working for Wayne Tech, sent down here to survey for copper deposits. Contact was lost with him four days ago. Bruce Wayne asked me to locate Barrett. Well, finished my job. Batman continues his 100% success rate. While they speculate about what happened to the guy, Hyatt finds some kind of tape recorder and pockets it without telling anyone. Going in deeper, they finally find the missing guy, Paige, but while he's alive, they see the egg near him has already opened. Paige knows something's wrong, that there's something alive inside of him, and Batman tries to get him free to try to save him, but Seely shoots him in the head, saying he was already dead. Batman is naturally pissed, but Seely doesn't care, only wanting to get the rest of them out of there in one piece. But as we see, Seelie will not be joining them, as a xenomorph tail slides down and around him, three of them descending on the guy. Seelie manages to shoot one right in its second mouth, but the acid blood sprays onto his face. This new origin for Two-Face is weird. Hyatt tries to assume command, get them all back to back so they won't get caught in the crossfire, but a xenomorph gets behind her. She's saved by Batman, who wraps a batarang and rope around its head to pull it back. It's utter chaos as the Guy Gardner looking dude is killed. Although maybe I'm wrong about that, usually when the aliens use their second mouth to kill someone, they go for the forehead, but this one went for his mouth. Maybe it was just giving him a kiss? 
Seely is surprisingly still alive despite the acid on his face. I mean, I'd assume it would have eaten through half his head by now. And Hyatt drags him away while Batman takes on the Xenomorph directly. I do like how the scene with him and the crocodile earlier was basically there to telegraph how physically strong he is and how he's actually capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a creature like this. You want a meal? Try me! I'm very salty and high in cholesterol! Batman does his best against it, even grabbing hold of the second mouth to hold it off, but he's still outclassed by the Xenomorphs' speed and strength. However, Seely manages to get a hold of his gun and lures them away from the others, saying that even if he dies, he's taken one of them with him and pulls out a grenade. The explosion collapses most of the area, though fortunately Batman shielded Hyatt and another soldier, Vanderpool, from the rubble. They have an emergency light, but its batteries are failing. Batman treats Vanderpool's arm, which had some acid spilled on it, and he asks how bad things are. Seely and Gantry are dead. Seely snuffed one of those things, but the other two are still out there somewhere. The explosion sealed off the corridor, so at least they can't get in here with us. For now, the collapse also cuts off our escape route back to the surface. Our supplies are nil, and Vanderpool is gonna need more complete medical attention than I can give. Those creatures have been in the ruin complex for days at the very minimum. Which means they have squatters rights. They don't appear to be intelligent in any conventional sense of the term. We heard that, you jerk! For the record, we think your mask looks pretty damn stupid too, thank you very much! But they're cunning. They've had time to familiarize themselves with the passageways. It's only a matter of time before they find a way to get to us. Bat bummer. And so our comic ends with a return to that crocodile from before as it gets the rope off of its jaw and swims underwater, rising again in a cave right outside of a hatching xenomorph egg. Well, hey, at least the crocodile's gonna get a good meal out of this before its jaw melts away. Anyway, this comic is much better than you'd think it would be. Originally, I planned to do both issues in one, because issue two begins in an absolutely silly way that got me to want to review this book. But in my efforts to get back on schedule, I didn't want to make the episode too long, and there's a lot of story in issue two. Plus, this thing has a few sequels. As for this first issue, though, like I said, the concept of Batman fighting Xenomorphs seems kind of ridiculous and out there, but they make it work very well. It's pretty much a straight-up horror story, and darkness is used quite effectively, especially at the very end with the battery-operated light going out and leaving our heroes in the dark. Despite knowing full well how the Xenomorphs work by this point, the story establishes the mystery well, and you see the wheels turn inside Batman's head as he tries to unravel this and learns of the horrors that have landed on Earth. That stuff with the crocodile, as I said, was to establish his strength. But in turn, it shows off how much more dangerous the Xenomorphs are, since Batman still has trouble with them, too. The Marines are the standard issue, cocky to the point of stupid, established in the Aliens franchise, given just enough characterization that they don't feel completely one-note, but in the end, they're still cannon fodder. The artwork is mostly pretty good, though I question a bit of the dialogue with characters acting like morons, or Batman establishes this as so nightmarish that it's on the level of his parents dying. That's just overwrought and unnecessary. But yeah, the book is good, and I look forward to eventually coming back to issue two for you guys. Next time, Patreon-sponsored reviews make their return with another crossover. The first animated one made after Disney bought Marvel.
autopilot plane programmed to ditch in the Gulf. How Bruce Wayne, after all these years, still has not run out of money is a mystery for the ages. 